Unlike in World War II, LSE stayed in London during World War I, and that meant that it was in an area of, of air attack. London was bombed by Zeppelins in the first half of the war and by what were called Gotha bombers in the second half of the war. So LSE students were able to, after their lectures, see the searchlights and the Zeppelins attacking, and actually a bomb did hit the LSE in April 1918 and damaged a skylight, though no one was hurt. But bombs nearby did hit Long Acre, for example, and more than 100 people were killed in Long Acre in April of 1918. Uh, the second thing is a large number of LSE students volunteered for military service, staff and students in total about 200, and about 70 of them were killed. And the third thing, at the beginning of the war, the arrival of Belgian and Russian refugees, probably about 200 refugees sitting in LSE lectures. Um, and then as the LSE staff and students who had volunteered went off to war, uh, the numbers actually staying in the school diminished, so that the school about halved in size. It's difficult to tell, but if we go by the student magazine, which in those days was called the Clare Market Review, they were very pro Britain's intervention in the war in 1914-15 wrote a number of uh, editorials saying that this was a just cause and it was good that the nation was involved in it, but also saying as the kind of proviso for this that British society needed to be rebuilt and reconstructed and reformed after the war. As we move into the second part of the war, um, by 1917-1918, we know there was growing disillusionment in the country as a whole. There doesn't seem to have been a strong anti-war movement in the LSE, but what there was in the LSE was a lot of support for an alternative approach, which is the war could be justified it was, if it was fought for strengthening international institutions, creating bodies such as the League of Nations, so that something like this could never happen again. Beatrice Webb, who's of course the wife of Sidney Webb, was uh, involved in the Reconstruction Committee, which was set up by the Lloyd George government in 1916 and in the second half of the war. She was a very active member of that Reconstruction Committee and got a lot of her proposals for post-war welfare reform and so on accepted by the committee. Other LSE students were involved in wartime housing planning, um, in wartime food planning. William Beveridge, who was going to become director of the LSE in the interwar years, was very active in the Ministry of Labour and also in the Ministry of Food. Um, so he was involved in the planning that led to the introduction of rationing and steps towards state intervention and showing that state intervention could work and help to create a fairer society. Sidney Webb, who with Beatrice we've already mentioned, um, were leading lights in the Fabian Society and in the creation of the modern Labour Party. And Sidney Webb is the key person really to look at, um, that he was the person who commissioned the first study by Leonard Wolfe of the League of Nations in 1915, and then in the second half of the war, 1917-1918, Sidney Webb cooperated very closely with Arthur Henderson, the wartime leader of the Labour Party, to give the Labour Party a new constitution, for example, um, including the Clause 4 of the constitution, which committed the party to public ownership of the means of production. A lot of Future leaders of the Labour Party had formative wartime experiences and many of them had LSE connections. Hugh Dalton, who was to become Chancellor of the Exchequer in the post-1945 uh, Labour government. R.H. Tawney, um, who did remain at the school both before and after the war, but did military service during the war and was wounded at the Battle of the Somme. But he becomes tremendously influential as a, con as a conscience and theorist for the Labour movement in the interwar period. At the end of the war, LSE emerges with lots of plans for expansion and, of course, is equipped with a new director. William Beveridge arrives to replace Pember Reeves with a very ambitious agenda for expanding the, the buildings, the site, the physical infrastructure of the school, but also adding to the syllabus. One of the key ways in which the syllabus was expanded in the 1920s was into the whole area of international studies, international law, international history, international relations, and learning from the wartime experience and preventing anything like that from happening again. 